it is. Oh, look at that. They just then added a voice to it. Hello, hello, ladies. Tell us where you are joining in from as we connect to the Facebook group. And then also let us know if you own today or if you are looking to purchase. We love to hear where you are in your journey as you are adding real estate to your wealth portfolio. My name is Rosalind Brown with Your Wealth Guidance. I want to thank you so much for joining us today for another great Money Monday. As always, we come to you each and every Monday with tangible tips to help you on your financial independence journey. And so we know that journey looks different for so many different people. Some people are going to gravitate towards one thing versus another, but this is your individualized journey. And we want to make sure that you have the tools to walk you along your path. And so today we have another great powerhouse speaker. I am excited because this is someone I have personally known for almost 20 years. Um, and so I have entrusted him with my very first home purchase. I want to apologize to him today for all of the hours and hours and hours <laughs> and Q&A that he spent um, with me as I went through that process and learned along the way. And so today we have Robert Allen. He has a passion for helping people find and get into their dream home. That's what happened for me many moons ago. In second grade, he did a project where they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he wrote that he wanted to be a realtor, which is kind of strange for a second grader. Not what my answer was. <laughs> and when his first teacher responded that his essay was not creative enough, Robert's answer was simple. Fine. I'll be president of the United States. Go Black Boy Joy. Um, and so Robert became a licensed realtor in 2002, has 18 years of experience in the real estate industry. Molded by his parents' experience, Robert has been able to excel in the market far different from when they sold real estate. Things are a lot different. We're hearing a lot of crazy things. We were talking before we got started about some of the things that we're hearing on social media of things that might not be legal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. You want to be aware of that? Um, and so because his mother was pregnant with him while studying for her broker license, it's in his DNA. Robert is with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Georgia Properties, and specializes in buyer sellers, investors, apartments, first-time home buyers, relocation buyers, and move-up buyers. In 2016, he was ranked in the top 4% nationwide for Berkshire Hathaway. Robert, the son of a broker, your agent for life. Thank you so much for the many years that you've helped me. Thoroughly enjoys meeting the needs of his clients and helping them save thousands of dollars. So without further ado, I want to thank you, Robert, for being here. And thank you in advance for sharing your knowledge. No, uh, thank you for having me. And thank you for thinking of me and looking forward to sharing what I know. Now tell us, there are going to be a number of different people in terms of where they are on their journey. So if you're a first time home buyer, I know one thing that you do a lot of is helping people find programs for their down payment assistance, um, helping people kind of maneuver the system, especially in this market. So if you're just getting started purchasing your first home, what are some of the bigger things to be aware of or tips or even pitfalls to stay away from? So honestly, I, I say one of the first things is uh, the mindset and, and making that choice, because sometimes people come into it thinking it's difficult or I don't know where people get. I need to have 20 percent down um, to get into a home. So you want to change your mindset that this is possible and, and I can make it happen. And it, it's always good when you can start with a realtor you trust, because technically, you know, we're not a loan officer, we're not a closing attorney, but we know the good ones in the industry and can direct you 
um, to get the, the right level of service in the areas that we're not an expertise in. And just having a conversation with a realtor um, and you wanna you know, do some research on that realtor to see if they have experience with first time home buyers. If a realtor is you know, trying to be on million dollar listing and all that kind of good stuff, they might not have the skill to help you as a first time home buyer. <laughs> Uh, understand what it's going to take for you to not only get into a home, but save the most amount of money that you possibly can when getting into a home. So even similar to you, you're in a great situation um, to where, you know, good employment, good income, good uh, credit and all that good stuff. But we still have the conversation about what program is out there that's going to save you money when getting into your first home. Now, for those first time home buyers, you talked about building that team. Now, mm -hmm. is the realtor first or is the banker first? So some people will go out and they'll start calling the bank, getting pre-approved and start calling around on some of these uh, <laughs> listings that exist on Zillow and so forth. What's the best order for someone to take if they're looking to purchase that first home? It's, um, it, it's the realtor. So uh, I've got someone on my team, for example, someone at her church is looking to buy and they want to use her and I'm coaching her on what the steps are and what you do. And uh, letting her know that, you know, offer them a free buyer consult, because during that consult with a realtor, they can find out things about your situation, because they're not going to have a, real, a, a lender, they're going to have multiple lenders. Um, so just earlier today, I was helping coach uh, agent on my team through, send them to this lender, because their situation is X, Y, and Z. Um, so for example, I've got one lender that does 100% financing with no mortgage insurance. But depending upon what side of town you're looking to buy on, depending upon what your credit score is, and depending upon what your income is, that program may or may not work for you. So that's why you need to have a consult because we can ask you these important questions and get the right information from you and then tell you what it is you need to do. Or even like the consult the um, uh, agent on my team did is she did a great job of getting information from them. Unfortunately, they're not in a position to purchase right now what they want, but we're able to connect them with the right lender that's going to have the, the patience to help them and also the right credit counseling that's going to help them as well. Because, you know, we're committed to helping them reach that goal. Even if they can't do it in the next 30 or 60 days, you know, we're going to be licensed. We're going to be realtors a year from now when they have hopefully done what they needed to do and follow the advice of the people we connected them with. Now, what should they bring? So someone is saying, all right, I got to do the realtor first. So I'm going to set up this meeting. Should mm -hmm. they bring a lot of documentation? Should they know what area? Should they know how much they're going to borrow? I think sometimes as a lender, especially a first time buyer, mm -hmm. you may say, goodness gracious, I want 200,000. And then you say, there's nothing in that area for 200000 What type of research or due diligence should a buyer do in advance of that first meeting? Really, uh, as far as information, the only thing you need to know or have an idea of is what your credit score is. And, you know, open mind and heart, because we're going to ask you some questions that some people might think some of the questions are personal, but those are the things that we need to know. So um, credit score, uh, you should know what your income is, even if you just know your monthly or what your 1099 or W-2 was the previous year, have some idea of that. Um, and then uh, honesty. So like one of my favorite questions is uh, <laughs> who is going to be involved in the decision making process? And I try to answer it different, ask it different ways. So I don't want to offend anyone, but, you know, is it you or is there anyone else that's going to be involved in the decision making process? Because that's the, one of the worst things to do. Um, if I can tell a quick story, uh, it's happened with a client my mom and I were working with. We have got maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 down payment assistance for this woman who was on Section 8, coming off Section 8, taking advantage of some of the programs in the city of Atlanta, and uh, new construction, brand new house, getting ready to buy it, all this free money. And at the end, um, after the inspection, after she's moving forward, after everything is going on, we're getting ready to close, her cousin comes by and starts to trash the house, saying it's no good and you shouldn't buy this and all this other kind of stuff. <laughs> well, two things. Number one, um, it would have been good to know that you're relying on your cousin before we had done all of this work. And then number two, you got to be careful with who you help 
who you allow to influence you and all this kind of stuff. Because some people get jealous. They don't want to see you come up. Or, you know, this guy wasn't an expert. I actually sold my cousin two years ago a house, a resale in the same subdivision. And um, there's nothing wrong with the house. <laughs> but you don't want to listen to just any and everybody. And you also want to make sure that if that person is important to you, that the realtor knows so that we can all look at the house at the same time versus, um, uh, you know, avoiding situations like that to where one person says they like it, then all of a sudden someone that's a decision maker pops up and, and ruins the whole transaction for you. And I hope she finally got her house and got this <laughs> bit of person out of her life because we know how that can be and all that free money on the table. We want to make sure she takes advantage of it. Now you yeah. talk about some of the down payment assistance. That's something that a realtor is going to be able to walk you through. Mm -hmm. Tell us some of the examples of things because you said some big numbers, $30,000, $40,000. Like that's nothing to mm -hmm. scoff at. Um, yeah. Those are big numbers about how someone can really offset a large portion of what they would either have to come to the table with or eventually pay. What are some sources or possible programs that people should be aware of? Yeah. Um, so I want to reiterate one thing I mentioned, which is, you know, we as realtors, we interview you, but you also want to interview the realtor. And so there's a question that you ask them. Did, do they have experience with first-time home buyers? And do you have experience with down payment assistance programs? So if the realtor doesn't know anything about them or isn't willing to look into them and work with them or is negative about them and down talks them, uh, that might not be the realtor for you if that's something you desire to do. Um, as far as programs that are out there in the state of Georgia, there are several, but depending upon where you are, a really good place to, to go to or suggest a realtor look at is the housing authority or the municipality that the, the you're interested in buying in. So a realtor that works for first time home buyers, all that kind of good stuff, we should know something. Um, but if we don't, or you want to make sure that they know everything that's possible and out there, then um, you know, you look at the Cab County Down Payment Assistance or the Cab County Housing Authority, rather. And sometimes those housing authorities will have a list of different opportunities and things that are available in that area. Uh, Georgia, we've got something called Georgia Dream, which I actually haven't used in uh, a couple of years because I've been able to find so many programs that are better. But um, in general, you know, $5,000 in down payment assistance that can go towards your down payment and closing costs. That's what we use with you. Um, the city of Atlanta has the most money. Uh, my personal record is $69,850. I helped someone get on a $140,000 purchase. And all of that money was forgiven after 10 years of staying in the property. Now I mentioned that number, but don't expect it in today's market. There are not as many programs like that available right now, um, but at least you know that <laughs> for me, I have the skill of, of how to layer different programs. So that wasn't one program, that was four different programs that we layered on top of each other because of where the house was located. So in general, the city of Atlanta is gonna have the most opportunity to have things like a hop and all these strange names. Um, they even have it so where you can get what's called a 203k or a renovation loan. If the house is in horrible condition, you can get a renovation loan and the down payment for that renovation loan, the city of Atlanta will give to you. Um, there's rules that come along with it. For example, you have to live in the home for X amount of years. Uh, my cousin, uh, I can't remember how much I helped him get. Maybe it was 40,000, maybe it was 30. Uh, can't exactly remember, but he's got to live into the live in the home for X number of years. He's gotten offers on the home for $100,000 more than what he bought it for right now. And um, that would be great if he can make that $100,000, but there's rules attached to it to where if he makes that, depending on how many years he stayed there, he has to pay a portion of his profits back to the city. So you want to make sure that you're aware of all the rules associated with the program that you use. That's big money. That uh, that might make it worth just staying in place for a little while longer. <laughs> now, yeah. moving from, okay, you've gotten your first home, or maybe you're thinking, goodness, maybe I want my first home to be an investment home. Mm -hmm. And one thing someone mentioned is off-market properties. 
-hmm. So in terms of finding those off-market properties, negotiating those terms, how to figure out if it's a good deal or not, especially if it's not on the market or either how to find those opportunities. Can you give us some insights into that? Sure. So, I mean, if you're looking at it from the investment standpoint, um, if you want it to be an investment, you almost initially, if you want it to be an investment, you almost have to find something that's off market because everything that's on the market right now has got bidding wars and the price is going up. And, and uh, there was one uh, couple that I was working with looking to get into some investing and, you know, they would run numbers to see if it was a solid investment and had different spreadsheets for that. And because of where the market is, none of the numbers worked for them as an investment. So um, off market distressed properties, uh, having a network of people that you work with. Uh, um, there's a, uh, a client of mine, I got into an investment deal. It was network. I never put the house on the market. I knew he was looking for an investment and I was thankfully able to connect him with it. Or another client of mine that just picked up a duplex. It was a listing that I had coming. And of course, I'm gonna look out for my clients and my, my favorite and best clients. And I let her know about it um, before it came. And uh, it, it had to hit the market, but she was able to be aggressive and know about it and move quickly and, and make it happen. Um, so there's different ways that you can network with your realtor. There's different ways you can network with divorce attorneys. Um, you can, you know, get your education up to learn how to put the deals together. You can network with what are called, um, I call them bird dogs, but they do uh, wholesale. There's different wholesalers you can work with. Um, to find something if you truly intend to make it an investment uh, initially. Now, that's interesting when you talked about the divorce attorneys, which I guess makes a lot of sense as people mm -hmm. are splitting assets and need to come up with cash in order to split that major asset that people acquire during a marriage. Mm -hmm. How would you go about finding some of these uh, divorce attorneys or what type of conversation are you having with them to say, you got a client with the house. Um, <laughs> how do you structure that? And what should you be prepared for if you have that conversation? Yeah. So divorce is, is a tricky uh, topic because, you know, there's already a lot of strife going on. You don't want to knock on the door and say, hey, let me buy your house. Um, so I've heard different strategies about how you kind of, you're, you're not aggressive with the person that's divorced. Um, but if you've got a relationship with attorneys, they can give you the heads up and all that kind of good stuff. So it's as simple as like market, network marketing. Get a list of 100 attorneys that have a decent amount of volume or something like that. Let them know that you're an able and willing buyer um, and network. Uh, what's one of the reasons I'm excited to have my wife join me in real estate is, you know, she's the opposite of me. She's never made a stranger and she's a people person. Um, but that's one of the things she's going to help me with is networking with, you know, uh, groups like this. Uh, because I need to personally have 100 to 200 attorneys that hear from me every month saying I've got clients or even myself would be interested in buying some of your clients that are divorcing their property. And then in terms of those wholesalers, how mm -hmm. are you finding those and vetting those to make sure that they're actual viable opportunities? And in terms of that transaction cost, we probably know a little bit more in terms of what you would pay for a realtor, but are you using a realtor in these transactions? And then how much or how are these people getting paid in the transaction? All right. So if you're not familiar with what the wholesaler is, uh, they basically go out and they do the dirty work and find opportunities. And a great example is, is that they might find a property for $100,000. They secure it with a contract and then they go out to the world of all the investors and their network and they say, hey, I've got this deal. It'll cost you $110,000. So they end up making the gap between 100 and 110. You as the investor have to take a look at that property and say for 110, does it meet my purposes? Um, and so that's where you need to take the initiative to, to get some of the knowledge you need to know uh, about what is or what is not a good investment, um, being able to vet it on the front end before you put it under contract for 110 and put earnest money at risk. You obviously can use a realtor uh, in those scenarios, but you're going to have to have a really good relationship with a realtor or probably get one that's inexperienced and, and, and young um, because investors can run you ragged and it never pays off. 
so I have clients that I work with that are serious that I help out, I run numbers for real quick, let them know. If they end up putting it under contract and moving forward, I spend a little bit more time on it of letting them know, hey, this is what I think this opportunity will look like for you. Now, in terms of vetting some of these, because especially these properties that are off market, you don't necessarily, I mean, we can go online and use our, our Zillow skills or Redfin or whatever in order to figure out what's a good price. But in terms of that negotiation, what does that look like between you directly now communicating with the buyer or with the seller? or maybe you're directly communicating with their attorney and what have you, are you putting together your own team and that's your own attorneys, your own inspectors and all of those kind of things? Or is that something that you can lean on? And are there some specific terms that you should be familiar with as you're going through that process? Yeah. So uh, there's, there's a, a, a couple of different thoughts I have on that because Ultimately, um, you don't want to have paralysis of analysis and you want to get into investing and you're thinking and you're overthinking and you're analyzing and I don't like this spreadsheet or how do I figure out my RI? You don't want to get bogged down and slow down and never do anything because you're overanalyzing things. Um, but at the same time, you want to have the habit of doing. Uh, I recently heard a story about Netflix. And if you think about Netflix, it actually, they started out mailing DVDs. They had the idea in the late 90s. Um, they were driving back and forth. I think they worked at Google or I don't know. I don't remember where they worked, but the co-founders, they had the idea. And what they did is they didn't wait till everything was perfect. When they got done with work that day, they said, hey, let's mail each other a DVD and see if our idea works. And DVDs are brand new. And uh, they couldn't find one. So they bought a CD and mailed each other the CD. And when it came in the mail, they say, Eureka, we've got a great idea. That's how Netflix started. So you've got you've to marry the two. Um, get out there, do something. But at the same time, don't overanalyze. Uh, so a, a good start for me is I always tell people about the millionaire real estate investor. That's a great start. Easy read very fundamental. If you read that, you'll know enough to do something. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to go out there and just, you know, try to buy something and, and ask your realtor, is this a good investment? And you're, you're giving them a whole bunch of deals that are crap because it's not, it's not worth anyone's time to learn from knowing nothing. So I don't know if that answered your, your question, but that's what I would advise people is you got to marry the two. Don't overanalyze but also at the same time, don't be afraid to start. Now I'll ask one question and you're in the Atlanta area. So we know different places are gonna be different in terms of money. Um, I come from Georgia, so that's my home, but I am definitely not in an Atlanta housing priced market anymore. So if you're in the Atlanta market, what's a good amount in terms of liquidity to say, okay, this makes sense. Maybe not 500, maybe not 50,000. But if you're saying, goodness, I'm not sure if I have enough in order to even get started, what should that range look like or how would one calculate if they're ready? For an investment or a personal purchase? I think investment property. I think that would be the next kind of thought there in terms of do I have enough to make that next? So you're going to want to think a couple of things. Are you flipping or are you uh, investing for long-term uh, rental property? Excuse me. So um, in Atlanta, you're probably not going to be able to get anything decent for under 150. So 150 to 200. And then you're going to need 20% down as an investor to get into something like that. Um, so that's a struggle for a lot of people when they're talking about getting started. So my honest advice to people is to, uh, I don't know if they call it house hacking or, or, or what they do, but uh, a, a great example of a really good friend of mine who is extremely smart. We played basketball together and, and uh, coach always said he was tenacious. He was going to outwork any and everybody. He um, has an interest in real estate. He got an MBA. 
uh, in real estate with a focus in real estate, super smart guy. He currently today analyzes and oversees billions of dollars in the portfolios, works for a company that advises major banks and all that other kind of stuff. And he always wanted to get into investing and talked about it. We started one time, never finished. We talked about it and he's looking at apartments and all this other kind of stuff. But what I told him is you got to start where you are. And where he was, he was able to find a, a qualifier for FHA. And with FHA, you can buy up to four units with only three and a half percent down. You can also sometimes take advantage of down payment assistance as well and put 0% down and still get into an investment property. And the story that I pitched to him is the bank only cares that you intend to occupy the property. When you fill out that application, you're saying you're going to occupy that home. But six months, a year later, you can do what you want. So he really wanted a condo for himself personally, but I got him a duplex um, in Cabbage Town, if you know where that is, Rosalind, and um, got it for him for 220. He did a renovation loan on F with FHA and was able to finance in $30,000 worth of repairs. This thing today is worth over $500,000. And what ended up happening is he lived in one side and he enjoyed living rent-free, mortgage-free. I think he was paying maybe $200 of his own mortgage. That's it. In Cabbage Town on a half million dollar property now. He got so spoiled with it, he just, he's never moved. <laughs> but the next thing that he's going to do is take that equity or take that opportunity and leverage it into another investment. That's the easiest way to get started. I've got another client that has done multiple investments and now just purchased a duplex using 100% financing. And um, was able to do it with little to no money out of her own pocket because she's going to occupy the home for a short period of time and then move on to something else. And I don't think you gave enough emphasis on that. So we talked about, all right, I'm going to go buy my first investment property at $200,000. I need to bring 20% down, i.e. $40,000. Or yep. I can purchase a multifamily and come to the table with 3% or less, which mm -hmm. is about $6,000 or less, <laughs> mm -hmm. purchase that 200. I'm not gonna say it'll appreciate the 500, but heck, even if it goes up to three <laughs> or 400,000 and yeah. you cash out that, now that gives you the 40,000 that you would have needed to yeah. purchase that property again. I don't think everybody kind of grasped that and put those numbers together because if a few years later, if it's only worth 400,000 and you take 80% of that 400,000, which is 320, and even if you still owe 180-ish, that's still over $100,000 that you can take out of that property to put towards Act something free. else. And Act so, free. yes. <laughs> and so that's a big thing. I don't think a lot of people really, and it's how you structure. And just like in most math, it's the order of operation. So if you started with the investment property, now you had to pull out $40,000 of your own savings versus five, $6,000 of your own savings live rent free and then take this money and build your empire. So the order in which you do things, and I know some people are like, but I want to do it. Maybe not. Or maybe they're like, I don't want to stay in an apartment anymore. Is it a small short-term sacrifice to get to a greater goal? It could be because even if all you do is buy your next primary home, that could be huge. Um, so I want to just take some time to emphasize that because that's huge in the order in which you actually spend your money. And so if you're looking at that first time home purchase and you're saying, I want to own two or three or four properties, the order in which you buy properties and how you buy them could make such a huge difference in terms of your cash flow. So definitely think about that. And that's a good conversation that you can have with your realtor too, as you're talking about your long-term goals, where are you going from here? Is this your first purchase? Are you planning to make three more in the next two or three years? How that actually looks and how the numbers can look for you too. So I think that was a really good point to make. Now, and, I know we were, oh, go ahead. Well, it, it, if I may, my, my favorite story and analogy to help people realize this is, is Apple. When Apple came out with iPhone 1, they had some idea of what they wanted to put in iPhone 2. 
Well, they understood speed to the market and they came to the market with what they could at iPhone one. They took those profits, bankrolled them and put them into perfecting iPhone two. You don't get a perfect iPhone two unless you make the profits from iPhone one. And you've got to realize that sometimes when you're starting with real estate. Uh, my parents' first purchase was a property that my dad used his VA loan for, which is 100% financing. And um, they went through several different ideas of what to do with the property from a rooming house to they actually turned it into a daycare and then later sold that daycare. And proud to say it's a daycare very, uh, to this very day off of I-20 in Moreland. Um, but they started with where they were and were able to build a portfolio of properties I, I think my mom told me one time, uh, maybe 60 properties that they had or 20 properties that they had and had all this income coming in. But it started with their iPhone one, which they used a owner occupying loan to be able to purchase. I think that's huge. And Kayla actually asked a question, which brings us to a topic we were talking about earlier today, mm -hmm. um, talking about should you start with flipping investment properties or something that is very popular today, Airbnbs? <laughs> what are your thoughts in terms of where one should get started? And then a little bit about the intricacies of the different options. Yeah. So I think... Um, my number one piece of advice for people is to have multiple exit strategies because none of us can predict the future. And um, one of the things that <laughs> I learned from my parents' um, success is when they ran into some trouble and they unfortunately were not able to hold on to all their properties um, that they had from commercial to residential. Um, so you want to have your exit strategies down pat. Uh, for example, especially right now in today's market, as hot as it is, if you're going into something saying you want to flip it, well, you need to have a backup plan in case you can't. What if the world shuts down again and uh, you can't sell the home or interest rates go up and no one wants to pay that top dollar anymore? What are you going to do? Is the number you're buying the property at going to be able to cover the rent or cover the mortgage if you have to rent it? Um, but then also at the same time, being flexible, if the market's doing crazy and you buy it as a, as a rental, um, uh, you know, just be aware of what your options are if you need to get out of the property uh, for whatever reason. Uh, my client that bought the duplex, she's going through the, the process of the side that I'm not occupying. Do I do Airbnb and make, you know, $2,500 a month or do I... Um, just get a traditional renter in there and they pay $1,200 a month. You know, that's honestly a question that I, I, I didn't give her the answer to. Um, I, I let her know to look at the black and white numbers um, and, and be flexible because you may find out that you don't like living next to um, Airbnb. Or what if you move out and you no longer occupy it and you've got a long-term tenant next to an Airbnb tenant? Um, and just encourage her to, you know, write the math down. What's my risk and what's my reward on each option? Uh, I think if it were me in this market, I am generally advising people to buy and hold. Uh, flipping is possible, but finding a really good deal that's worth the risk is so difficult you will run yourself ragged looking for that right deal unless you get lucky. Um, I've got a client that I hooked up, got him into something for 190. Uh, we'll hopefully sell it here for 370. You know, that was a rare situation to where I found a good flip for someone. Uh, but the majority of people, and honestly, the real way to build wealth is to buy and hold. Uh, get into something, even if you're not making an astronomical amount of money, uh, uh, it's going to pay off over time. With Airbnb, um, it's so tempting. Just make sure that you're aware of certain things like um, your local city, are they about to ban Airbnb? Uh, in Historic College Park, there was somebody that did a duplex and all this other kind of stuff. Well, what ended up happening is uh, it ended up not being a good investment because uh, the city of College Park was about to ban Airbnb. So you want to stay away from that in certain cities. 
um, certain municipalities, or even if the property is in a subdivision, you need to know that most subdivisions are going to require a minimum of a 12 month lease. Um, so if you're going to do Airbnb, just make sure you've done your research and you know the things that you need to know, because those numbers are so tempting. They really are. But what if you can't get them? I think that's huge. And we were talking a little bit from a liability perspective, because some people are not notifying their insurance agents that mm -hmm. this is not a rental. This is an Airbnb, which is a little bit of a different um, category. Mm -hmm. But um, we also talked about from a lending perspective. So if you're growing your portfolio and you're starting with one or two properties, typically, if you have a traditional rental with a 12 month lease, you're going to give your lender a copy of that lease. You're going to show them that you've received the last six months of that 12 month lease. And they're going to say, great we're gonna give you credit for X amount of rent that you have. And the difference is a little bit on the Airbnb side because you don't have that lease. Um, so I know you had an example to share. I think that's something good that people might not be aware of because you may be making more in the moment, um, but I know a lot of people when COVID hit and people weren't going anywhere, that can be an issue, but especially if you're looking to use this income to then qualify for something else. Yeah. Yeah, so the example that I was giving Rosalind earlier is uh, someone on our team has a, a client moving here and they've done well for themselves with investment properties and several of the investment properties are Airbnb. But they're looking to buy a $600,000 dream home here in Metro Atlanta. And um, a, a simple way to describe how it works is, let's say you make $10,000 a month. Uh, the bank is gonna say you can afford $3,000 towards your mortgage. Well, if you have three rental properties out there and the mortgage on each of those three rental properties is $1,000 each, or they're gonna say you can afford zero on the mortgage for your own home, unless you can show a lease, a 12 month lease or something like that and a history of leasing. Well, then the bank will say, you rent it for, I think the math on this is gonna be right, you are close to right, you rent it for, 1200. Uh, we can give you a thousand dollar credit towards it. Um, they give you 80% of the um, uh, what you, you get in rent credit towards it. And you would still have the remaining $3,000 available to buy your dream home. Well, if you do Airbnb, you can't do that. It's going to be zero still. Uh, so what this couple is having to do, they're able to only put it in the husband's name because the wife's name is the one that owns the properties that are Airbnb. And it creates a problem for them uh, putting the wife on the loan and still qualifying for the mortgage. So uh, again, you know, you want to know your exit strategy when you go into something, um, but you also want to know some of these details or speak to a qualified expert on, okay, yes, I'm buying these three Airbnb properties or I own these three properties. I want to turn them to Airbnb, but I plan on starting a family in five years or two years or next year. Um, what do I need to know? You need to ask these kind of questions to a professional that can hopefully give you the right advice um, to make the right decision. And I think that's big. Over and over and over again, I talk about building your team. And when you build your team, it is not transactional. It's someone that you're going to say, I'm just buying my one house. I want to be a landlord. And that's fine. Have that conversation. Or I want to own 10 homes by the end of three years. Well, then you want to kind of talk strategy. You want to make sure that you have a realtor that understands how to get you there. You want to have a realtor that understands where the market is and can talk you through these different options. But if you don't have a team and you're just kind of looking at this from a transactional state, you're doing one transaction and that person who's helping you with the transaction isn't able to talk you through what comes next. So you're like, all right, just do the transaction so I can get this property and set it up on Airbnb. But you didn't have the conversation that six months from now or a year from now, I now want to buy a bigger home. I want to relocate all of these different things. And now the bank is still the bank. And they're going to say, yeah, I don't, I don't care how hot Airbnb is. <laughs> we don't do what's hot. <laughs> we do what we can see records for. And I think that's huge is because Innovation doesn't necessarily happen in the banking world. It's very traditional. It's very old school. That just, that ain't gonna happen. And so, yes, if you want to look at alternative financing, 
maybe a little more expensive. That might be an option. You might want to take that risk, but you want to talk about what that risk actually looks like. Because, I mean, you talk about how great the market is, but at the same point in time, that can change. (laughs) At any point in time. And we don't know when that turn will happen. So you may be at a situation where you need to sell at a loss to come up with liquidity or your Airbnbs just aren't happening the same. Um, Like I said, I live in DC and they did change in terms of limiting the number of days that you can rent unless you live in the property versus if you don't live in the property. So if you were cash flowing and you're happy and then they're like, "Mm, no, if you don't live there... (laughs) And now you're capped for the rest of the year in terms of the number of days that you can rent. That's a big deal. Um, If your insurance goes up significantly or your insurance carrier is saying, nope, I want to insure that. Or if you forget to change your insurance and something happens, so they party in and burn the building down or (laughs) fall off the balcony or whatever it might be. And now your insurance company says, actually, these aren't tenants. These are different than traditional tenants. You want to make sure that you're having a conversation with your overall team in terms of that as well. So I think, Kayla, that's a really good question. Now, she brought up the flipping um, in terms of trying to figure out if a deal is worth it or if it makes sense in one particular market versus another. I know you said buy and hold, but some people, you know, you watch and flip this house and they making hundred thousand dollars a house, <laughs> a house every six weeks or every episode, and you're saying I want to jump into it. What are some things to be aware of if you're saying, you know, HGTV was doing to flip this house? If they can do it, I can do it. What are some things to be aware of on that side? So, uh, I have actually signed a uh, non-disclosure with HGTV. Check it out on June 3rd at 10 p.m. I'm going to be on House Hunters. Uh, So I've seen a little bit of behind the scenes. And um, so uh, it was a different show. But let's just say on on Flip This House or whatever, it's not as easy as they make it look on TV. Uh, I would most definitely, again, recommend Millionaire Real Estate Investor starting out with that. But one of the numbers that they put in there is for every thousand deals that you come across only one or two are worth buying so you've got to really have that mindset going in you got to kiss a lot of frogs you got to do a lot of work you need to vet a great number of deals and you need to be strong in the sense of um, knowing your numbers so what happens sometimes is i've seen it happen um, to where they're just so tired of not finding a deal that you make a decision on a property that if you really ran the numbers on it, it doesn't make sense. You've gotta be disciplined. You've gotta know I need a 20% uh, amount of equity or I need to make X amount of dollars. You make the determination for yourself and then you try to find where in your market those opportunities are and you stick to your numbers. And no matter if it takes you six months or a year to find the right one, because if you, you budge from what your numbers are and what you've made a decision about before you've got emotional about losing out on multiple offers or not finding anything, you might find yourself in a bad situation to where you, you, you make a bad choice. Um, so I don't know if that does a good job of answering the question, but that's, it's, it's, I would stress it is not easy. Even, even for me, having been licensed for 19 years, my first sale 18 years ago, was um, uh, an investment property I sold to my mom. Uh, my dad was the listing agent. My mom was the buyer. The two houses right right, ne- right next door to each other. And uh, it ended up being a good deal for my mom. And I'm just kind of along for the ride, learning what I can, um, or even growing up around it. I- I've got one right now where I gave the advice, but there's just so many details to where, you know, they could have put in better light fixtures. They could have been in better doorknobs because of the price that they listed the house at. We could have done a better job. And even I could have given better advice up front, um, you know, instead of assuming that they as investors knew what to put into the house, giving them the advice of what to put in the house, uh, because it ends up not being as, as easy a sale because of little details like that. So I'm not discouraging anyone from making uh, the choice to flip, but I am strongly encouraging people to get educated and to be willing to put in a lot of work. Um, for that kind of payoff, especially in this market, 
because you don't want to get lazy and make a bad choice and lose your shirt. Now back to the house hunters. <laughs> so you say you know, say so much. I know we're always watching it. Is this going to be one of those where somebody is like, I color and coloring books for a living and I'm about to buy a $500,000 house. Like, is that something we should be expecting? <laughs> well, you know, you got to tune in and see. Um, I, I don't think they folk. I don't think they focus on that on the newer episodes, but it's, it's a great couple. It's, um, you know, you know, we're speaking about investing. Uh, this is a young man who knew what he wanted out of life, came to Atlanta, met him in a class, educational class, helped him get $16,000 in down payment assistance. Uh, he lived in the house for a couple of years, uh, helped him make some money, moved into a condo, had a baby, needed to move out again. And so now they're, that's what the episode is going to be about. Um, their family is expanding. They're buying a, a very nice home um, in a nice area. Uh, but he does flipping now. He does investments. He's he's doing what you're talking about. But he still started where he could. He learned what he could along the way. And he's out here hustling every day. He's calling people, talking to people, looking for those those right flips. And so, um, yeah. And he's able to get his his family the house that he wants um, together as a great couple. So tune in. It's it's going to be hope. I haven't seen it, but I'm assuming it's going to be a great show. And um, yeah, get you excited about getting your dream home. I love it. We're going to all have to tune in and give you some feedback. Yeah. Now, one other thing, and we've talked about this before as a group, if you're in New York, you're in California, you're in DC, you're probably like, oh, Jesus, like even 3% is a whole bunch of money. Um, what do you think about people who say, maybe I want to invest outside of where I live? So I'm looking to buy a rental property in a whole nother state, in a whole nother city, just simply because real estate where you are. I mean, I know some people were listening when you said, oh, you know, maybe 150,000 people like to buy what? Like, what can you get? <laughs> and so if you are in that type of location and you know for a fact there is nothing but a parking spot available for $150,000 where you are, um, what should people think about if they're saying, goodness, maybe I'll invest outside of my home turf and be a landlord in another state or another city? What are some things to consider there? You really need to have a good team if that's the case, people that you can trust. Um, and you need to you know, be aware there might be additional costs because it's, it's really hard to manage your property and you're not there, you're not local, you can't go check on the property at least once a year to see the inside or something like that. So it's gonna cost you a little bit more. Um, because of COVID, it's, it's presented a unique opportunity that <laughs> my, my old trusty advice of owner occupied is actually an option to where I've seen people where um, because of COVID are able to get employers to say that their job is not currently dependent upon them living uh, or coming into the office and that they work remotely. And they're able to actually get an owner occupied home um, in another state. Now, again, um, you know, my clients that have done that end up, or the one that did that, they travel with their job or whatever. So they legitimately use it sometime and then they do Airbnb and all the other kind of stuff. But so, you know, basically get creative, think outside the box, um, get a really good team. Um, some general advice that I give people uh, when it comes to where to invest is something I learned from uh, one of my mom's clients, which is the Walmart theory. Uh, he was a home builder who built homes. And he says, you know how I pick the next place I'm gonna build a home? Is I see where they're building a new Walmart. And his theory was Walmart can afford to pay multiple people well into the six figures to understand demographics and all the you know, financial things that go into, I need to put a Walmart here. So if a company like Walmart with all their millions and billions is smart enough to put or move or invest in a certain area, I don't need to have their knowledge. I just need to follow what they do. So you could take a look at Atlanta, for example, a lot of people outside investors are pouring millions and millions of dollars into Atlanta because they've looked at the demographics. They've looked at Google opening up new headquarters. They've looked at the money that's coming in here um, and, and look for strong uh, 
job markets. Um, the Sun Belt is doing very, very well. Arizona, Georgia, um, Florida, and I feel like there's another one, but those are the main three that a lot of investors are pouring tons of money into them. Now, we also have a good question, especially we're talking about investors and so forth. But if you are a buyer and you're looking at these prices and saying, mm, maybe I'll sit on the sideline for a little while longer, do you have any thoughts or ideas in terms of when we should anticipate seeing the market cool a little bit so that there aren't a hundred offers on every single property that comes to market? My honest question to myself is, for me personally in Metro Atlanta, is Atlanta what LA was 30 or 40 years ago? So what I mean by that is, I, you know, I don't think we're going to have all these million dollar houses here in Atlanta that are at crazy prices, but basically your average American cannot afford to buy a house in LA or Los Angeles. And um, I even just lost a listing that I had sold twice but the sellers got cold feet because they own the house free and clear for Atlanta in a, here in Atlanta, five bedroom house, $300,000. But when they took their $300,000 to go look in LA area, even in the suburbs, they can't buy anything. Um, and so they, they decided to stay. But the, the point of that is you need to get into the market today because yeah, there might be a crash or there might be a, a, a correction that comes but I truly believe that this might be the new baseline. This might be the new bottom. So as prices continue to go up, if they ever come down, they might not go below where they are today. So the longer you wait, the more it's going to cost you in the future in the way of higher interest rates and um, higher prices. Uh, my mom taught me this. One of the first things she taught me is when someone asks you, when is the right time to buy? The answer is now. And it's not a sales pitch. If you buy a house today and interest rates go down, refinance. Um, if you buy a house today and prices go down, you should never lose money on real estate. Uh, you know this, Roslyn. You held on to it. You rented it out. And when prices went to where you wanted them to go and your tenants paid down your mortgage, you made money. And if you make a smart purchase, you're not going to lose money on the value of real estate if you do it right. So, yeah, you, today, Right now, if you can afford credit wise and having a stable job wise to buy a house, even if you have to compromise on where that house is and what that house has, you need to do it today. It's like planting a tree. The best time to plant a tree was 25 years ago. And I'll piggyback on that. I did purchase my first house in 2006. And I was adamant, I was a money person back then. And I'm like, all right, I want to foreclose home. I want to negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. And sure enough, I did. And um, yet and still 2008, 2009 happened. And I received a great job offer in 2009. And they wanted me to move in two weeks. So uh, <laughs> I then needed my place rented because the market would not support a quick sale um, to the point where I would have any kind of profits because we were in the midst of 2008, 2009. And so it was rented within a couple of weeks, thank goodness. And I was out and living my life and uh, accidental landlord learning um, as I go. But I mean, like you said, it might not be the time to sell, but it can still, people still need a place to live. And sure enough, still got um, tenants at that point in time, tenants I never met. I couldn't even tell you people's name to save my life today. Uh, but I am so thankful for them because I did not have to pay that mortgage on my own. And I could then move on, accept the job offer that I wanted to, and then continue to kind of take risk and live my life and make additional investments going forward. So just to kind of piggyback on your point, I did everything that I possibly thought that I could have done to make a good decision. And who knew that things would turn out the way that they did, but I didn't want that to stop me from accepting an opportunity and moving on. And then I became a landlord. Um, and that was that. So you live, you learn, you'll never time it right because I thought I had timed it right. We were in the midst of so many 
um, so many foreclosed homes and going through and we were going back and forth with banks and trying to buy directly from banks and so forth. And I thought I'd really done a really good job. And then the market happened. So it is what it is. You can, only, you can only plan so much and things will still continue to happen. So that's my story. Um, that's how I actually became a landlord was truly by accident of do I stay here and I'm stuck and I have to say no to this opportunity for me to move on or do I rent it out, hurry up, make my mortgage payment, move on with my life. And that's actually what I ended up doing. Um, one other thing, so we're at our closing remarks, are there things that people should be thinking about if they're on the fence about getting started? If they're trying to figure out, is this the realtor for me? I'm trying to put together my team. What are some of the things as people kind of say, all right, I'm gonna buy something by the end of the year. What should be on their list of things to do? So find out your credit score is number one. Uh, number two, set up a consult with uh, a realtor. And the realtor should ask you questions. If a realtor says, hey, let's get you pre-approved so I can start showing you houses, that's the wrong person you want to work with because they're not getting the chance to know you um, or know anything about you um, and your situation or how they can help you. Uh, and then, you know, once you've kind of decided which route you want to go, you need to ask your, your realtor, do they have experience in that? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Roslyn, but you purchased a HUD home? I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, do you know how many realtors know how to work HUD homes right now? But did you know that HUD only requires a $100 down payment if you buy with FHA? So not only did we get Rosalind down payment assistance, her down payment was only $100. And she was able to use the rest to pay her closing costs. And I'm thankful to my mom who taught me all the tricks and how to take $50 off right here. Because, you know, we've actually won offers by $100 by knowing how to work the back end of HUD. Uh, but if your realtor doesn't know these things and you have an interest in doing them, then you're wasting everybody's time. Um, because you might get tied to someone that can't truly help you have the best possible outcome out there. Um, so, I mean, really, if you do those two things, you'll be ready to rock. And my, my number one is always mindset. There's so many ways to make money with real estate. There's so many ways to give yourself a raise. If you're paying rent in an apartment right now and you make $10,000 or whatever you make, you're paying more in taxes now, I'm not a tax professional confirmed with your tax advisor, all this other kind of stuff. You're paying more in taxes and your paycheck is going to be lower because they're withholding more on your taxes. Simply by buying a house, I've seen people increase their weekly or monthly take home by $100 because the interest on their mortgage is now tax deductible. Um, so boom, right there, you just gave yourself a raise buying a house. Or um, Roslyn, you know, she hung in there and she had a nice check at the end of everything because she made a decision all those years ago. So make that decision, have the mindset, believe it's going to work out great. I've got client, I've got a client um, who's paid off her student over a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. And I'm responsible for maybe 70,000 of that because of the money I helped her make through real estate. So you want to get excited and encouraged about it. You want to have the happy mindset, the good mindset of take the risk, take the swing, make it happen. I think that's good information. Once again, the time to buy is now mm -hmm. and get you a good team, a team, a team, a team, um, and make sure that team is relationship-based and not transaction-based. I say it over and over and over again, and I really don't care what topic we're talking about. You still need a team and you still need professionals and you still need to make sure that you're not trying to do it all on your own because it can cost you more to do it all on your own. I've done a lot of home projects that I've had to end up calling a true professional. And so over and over and over again, I'll tell you to build your team, interview your team, make sure it's somebody that you want to deal with. I'm quite sure that by the end of my first home purchase, you probably didn't want to deal with me anymore, but I am glad that I wanted to deal with you. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much I for being that. with me. And so you want somebody, because if you're just starting out in the process, you want somebody who's going to educate you along the way and be patient with you along the way, because this is a lot of people's largest purchase ever. 
and you want to feel comfortable in that transaction. So make sure it's somebody that you feel delighted to pick up the phone and call that will receive a quick text message or email from you and actually take the time with you. Because if they don't have time for you, then you're really going to be in an awkward situation making a decision that you may not feel comfortable with. So I want to thank you all for joining me for another great Money Monday. Again, thank you, Robert, for dropping your gems with us as we continue to grow our wealth and use real estate as a vehicle in order to do it. Please remember to join us next week. We have another great speaker. I can't wait to introduce you to our speaker of next week. She is definitely a phenom when we talk about financial independence and some of the things that she's done and the risk that she's taken. So until then, thank you so much. Focus on your journey and the steps that you can take. And until then, we'll see you next week. Have a good night.